<laughs> this is true, he said this. He once knowingly gave a blowjob to a Republican. It's Andy Nicasso. <laughs> Welcome to the second most terrifying experience of my life. <laughs> 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 the Republican being the first? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna read about the first now. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been fascinated with dark places. When I was three years old, I found my way down my grandmother's basement stairs and into her clothes dryer. I pulled the door closed and stayed in there until my mother, completely frantic, finally found me a half hour later. I don't remember it, but she says I look completely comfortable and at home in there, curled up and smiling, completely oblivious to my near-death situation. <laughs> As I grew older, my fascination with dark places grew to include people who had a certain darkness to them. Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Edie Sedgwick. When I was 12 and other kids were reading Tiger Beat or the Hardy Boys, I was in my closet with the door closed, using a flashlight to read books like The Exorcist or Francis Farmer's Autobiography. <laughs> No surprise to anyone, at least of all myself, when at the, age, when the tender age of 37, I became a meth addict. Uh, and not just any run of the mill meth user. Because I came to addiction so late in life, I made up for lost time by giving it my all. I became something of an extreme sports version of a tweaker. Raging, oversexed, four mental hospitals, three overdoses, sleeping in public parks, and trading sex for drugs. Why couldn't I stop? Pretty simple. Because one hit up that glass pipe simulated in moments a feeling of comfort in my own skin that years of therapy hadn't been able to achieve. And because it made me hornier than I'd ever been. <laughs> ever. <laughs> the kind of chemically induced horniness that makes an innocent electric toothbrush seem suddenly full of new possibilities. <laughs> if you haven't smoked meth, you're just going to have to trust me this <laughs> My life like, looked less like an innocent. My life looked less like an episode of intervention than it did an episode of Jackass. There was so much insanity, bad judgment, and occasional insertion of random household objects. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I gave up seven years of my life and four of my favorite teeth to that drug. But the boy who loved dark places had met what became, for a while, the love of his life because there's no darker place in meth addiction. I put my partner Patrick through a living hell. <clears throat> He's a great guy who's never touched hard drugs and doesn't share my fascination with darkness. Whenever I asked for help with getting clean, he was there for me. But when I was acting like a nut job doing insane things like swinging a machete in our house or chasing my dogs around with a Tupperware container trying to get clean urine to cheat on the drug test. <laughs> smart enough to either kick me out, call the police, or change the locks. Basically, if I wanted to get my shit together, he'd be there for me. If I didn't, he made sure he took care of himself. When it came to setting boundaries, he made Candy Finnegan look like a fucking amateur. <laughs> because Patrick had some weird stick up his butt about letting me mess around with other drug addicts in our home, I took to tweaking at the Coral Sands Hotel. Uh. <laughs> now it sounds like some fancy Caribbean resort. <laughs> it's actually just a seedy hotel on Western Avenue with 60 rooms and a giant courtroom full of gay guys doing drugs oh. and each other. <laughs> the Coral Sands reputation in the gay community is so bad, very few self-respecting homos will ever say, even say its name, let alone admit having been there. It's sort of the Voldemort of gay establishments. <laughs> Dark, dark place. <laughs> and even better, it was full of other shadow dwelling fuck ups like myself, so I felt completely at home there. In the spring of 2005, three years into my addiction, I'm sitting naked on a bed in room 233 of the Coral Sands, sharing my meth pipe with a stranger. Except he doesn't feel like a, <laughs> Except he doesn't feel like a stranger, and that's another thing meth does. When you smoke with someone else, it's as if you've known them forever and you can see deep inside their souls and they can see into yours. Like you were lovers in a past life, the drug is reunited. Until it wears off or one of you comes, of course. And then it's appropriately awkward again. <laughs> but now we're high as kites and we're facing each other making out. And he runs his hand along my back and leans in to ask me, do you get fucked? And that's a good question. I think back to all the jobs I've lost, all the bushes all those cops have dragged me out of, just the fucking mess my life has become, and I answer, 
Uh, figuratively, I get fucked all the time. But he just looks at me, either because he doesn't know what figuratively means, or, or, or maybe because it, it was a really bad joke. That's, that's another thing meth does. It makes me think I'm really, really funny. I'm actually just pathetic. But I need to clarify, so I tell him no, and firmly. Because even with my history of incredibly bad judgment, I know the statistics regarding HIV infection among meth users. I watched too many friends die in the 80s and 90s, and there is no fucking way I'm going out like that. He doesn't try to persuade me, and I'm relieved. He leaves for a moment and returns with some GHB, which is a drug that was developed as, a medical, as medical anesthesia, but it's way more fun in the bedroom than it is in the operating room. We do some, and it takes a while, but when it hits, I'm suddenly engulfed in waves of incredible warmth, my body feeling only pleasure, fireworks exploding behind my closed eyelids. I force them open, realizing that I'm going under, losing consciousness. I try to sit up to regain my mental footing, but the rush is rumbling toward me like a freight train. The room, lit only by the flickering closed-circuit porn on the TV, begins to darken further. I feel panic, but there's nothing I can do, and I slip headlong into the total darkness of the G-hole. It's 1972, and I'm eight years old. A long, dark tunnel under the hedges in my backyard is my new favorite dark place where I fantasize that I'm Captain Kirk, trapped in with only a few minutes of oxygen left. Or I'm Gilligan. Or to be honest, because I'm a gay kid, sometimes Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm leaving the castaways away from the headhunters to safety through an underground volcanic passageway. I crawl on my hands and knees, my husky boy tough skin is blackened by the moist earth and rotting leaves, towards the light at the other end of the tunnel. In room 233, I return to consciousness slowly like one of those Titanic passengers fighting their way to the surface against the suction of a sinking ship. When I do reach the surface, I become aware that, strangely, my body is rocking. As my vision slowly clears, I see that a few inches from my face is the face of the stranger, who minutes, or maybe hours, before had been laying next to me. But now he's on top of me. And then I realize that he's, in he's inside me. I'm eight years old, crawling through that dark hedge tunnel in my backyard. Reaching the end, I stand up and squint my eyes against the sunlight. I notice movement on my chest and look down in horror at a giant praying mantis that has attached itself to my t-shirt. The monster is at least six inches long, scaring and waving its huge forelegs. I try to scream, but I'm too scared. I want to run, but I'm frozen. I want to flick it off, but I'm too terrified to touch it. I'm eight years old, and there's a monster on my chest. I push the man off of me and pull up against the headboard. At the same moment I see he wasn't using a condom, I also see that there are now others in the room. Two men are standing next to the bed, watching and touching themselves. A fourth sits smoking in a chair by the window. Before falling into the G-hole, I was happily living out a scene from Sid and Nancy. But now suddenly I'm in what feels like a gay mashup of The Accused and Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> In a flash, I understand all those movies where Meredith Baxter, or Jodie Foster, or Marky Post chop off all their hair in post-violation rages. <laughs> because at this moment, I would peel off my own skin if I could. And I want to scream at the man who is now kneeling in front of me, all lifetime movie-like, I told you no. But instead, I just quietly say, I think I'm done. And the men wrap towels around their waists and leave. Once the door closes and I'm alone in room 233, panic takes over. I lunge for the shower. I don't wait for the water to get warm. I grab a small bar of soap from the ledge and rub it frantically between my legs, hard and rough, trying to murder any intruding viral organisms, wondering how many of those men had used me while I was unconscious. And though I pray it was only the one, I know one is all it takes. And I try to squelch mental images of myself covered in Kaposi sarcoma lesions. I practically violate myself again, trying to erase the horror with the small pink rectangle of disinfectant hope. When the soap is almost gone and I have no more tears, I dry off and return to the bedroom. I kneel next to the bed, find my cell phone, and turn it on, finding over 20 voicemails from Patrick. There have been so many voicemails from Patrick these last few years, all of them terrified or angry versions of, Andy, where the hell are you? I dial our home number, and he answers on the second ring. At first, I can't speak because I can't get words past the sobs. I hear Patrick's voice saying my name, and it reminds me of what I've lost, what I used to be before the myth. 
It reminds me of goodness, kindness, morality, clean sheets, mop floors, and sweet, gentle calm. It reminds me that all my life I've had access to beauty, but chose instead to explore the ugly. It reminds me that I'm 40 years old, and despite all warnings, still crawling into dark places and subjecting myself to terrible, clinging consequences. All I can say is, Patrick, I'm in trouble. That was six years ago, and I still carry a few scars from that day. But I wear them gladly because it turned out what happened in that room saved my life. It was the first time that any of the monsters I'd encountered in any of my dark places had actually bitten me. Even that praying mantis eventually flew away, terrifying but harmless. For the first time in my life, I became scared of the dark, which may be a bad thing if you're a little kid trying to sleep in your own bed for the first time. But for me, fear of the dark in dark places was my first step towards sobriety. It still took me three more years to get clean, and I'm still an atheist, but I now firmly believe in miracles. Like the miracle of three years without a meth binge, or the miracle of five years of negative HIV tests, the miracle of getting my friends back, and the miracle of finally understanding the beauty of calm and of living in the light. And the biggest miracle of all, my now husband, Patrick, who always protected himself, but still waited so patiently at the mouth of every dark tunnel I crawled into, holding a flashlight and waiting patiently, somehow knowing that I'd eventually find my way out. <laughs>